Okay, well, um, I'll say welcome to everyone. Thanks so much for joining us and thanks Terry for being here. Um, if you just jumped on, um, I think Terry would prefer that if we can just save questions until the end, that would be great. But if you feel like, oh man, I gotta ask this question now, then go ahead and put it in the chat um, rather than unmuting yourself. Um, so that Terry can just focus on what he has to say. Um, but yeah, feel free to throw it in the chat. And then at the end, there's going to be some time for question and answer. And we can go through those questions that are already in the chat first. So, um, and if, if there's anyone who doesn't know where the chat is, just a quick review. If you are on, um, if you're on a phone, this is not correct information, but if you're on a computer, it just pull up that bar right at the bottom of your Zoom screen and there's a little um, dialog box and it says chat and you can just type right in there if you have a question. And I think that's it, Terry, take it away. Okay, thanks, Carrie. I'm excited to be here because I love the things that the Folk School does and it's a real privilege to be able to participate in, in some of the good things that they do. So what I'd like today to talk about today is pragmatic approaches for stewardship. So actions that each one of us can take that would promote sustainability. And I thought I'd start by giving you the bottom line as I see it, that we've got, uh, the planet is in a serious situation and the situation's getting worse. And this has to do with changes in the environment, changes in the ecology of our planet and changes in the social environment for society. And so I feel that the future of the planet and our grandchildren is at risk. I'd like to make sure that my grandchildren and your grandchildren have the same spectrum of opportunities that I've had. And I would like not to constrain those by taking too much and not leaving enough for the next generations. And another reason for concern, I think, is that each of us, logically enough, feels helpless to make a dent in such a massive problem as global degradation of the and that the easiest solution is just to give up and let it go on and say, well, this, there's nothing I can do here. Uh, I'm just gonna go on with my life. So those, those are my reasons for concern, but I also have reasons for optimism because I feel that we know how to fix most of the problems that we face. And there's important things that each of us can do. So what we need are some strategies for for solutions, some ways that we can move forward and make things better. So just briefly, let me say something about some of the problems. One of the, one of the things that we face is changes in climate. And you, here you see the, the range of temperatures of the planet as a whole over the last uh, 1300 years, I think it is, or 1700 years. And in the red line at the right, you can see the temperature, the average temperature of the planet over the last century. And this is based on the instrumental record, whereas the earlier record is based on ice cores. And one of the things you can see is that the temperature is, is warming extremely rapidly and it shows no signs of slowing down. This is, Climate change is just one of the problems we face, but it's not just temperature. There are problems with temperature, such as thawing of, of, of permafrost, but there's also extreme events that are triggered by warming temperatures. So as when you get a warmer ocean surface, that transfers more heat to the atmosphere and you get hurricanes, stronger hurricanes. You get warmer forests in Alaska, these dry out and you get more wildfires, larger, more severe wildfires. So these are some of the extreme events that we face. 
So let, let's just look at the whole picture, at least as I see it. The, the, the basic reason why, the, why things seem to be changing so rapidly over the last century or so is because of human activities on the planet. Basically, the increase in the number of people on the planet and the increase in the resources that we use. Here you see the, the changes in global population and water use as an example of one of the resources. Uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in 1750. And these changes in drivers of, of factors that are happening on the planet have impacts. They influence the environment, such as changes in northern hemisphere temperature or global temperature. They affect the proportion of the Earth's surface that's converted to agriculture and other other types of systems that uh, are explicitly dedicated to meeting the needs of society. And these changes in environment and ecosystems have important consequences, such as the extinction of species, the numbers of resources that we've explained, like the, the proportion of marine fisheries. And these in turn have effects on society. And we can talk about these in, in general terms and as, uh, the, as the services that nature provides to society. And some of these services are increasing. We've got more food production. That's an, uh, something that comes from nature. We've got more aquaculture and uh, farming of salmon, uh, shellfish, and so forth. But if you look here at this, lower right, you can see that the vast majority of the benefits that society receives from nature are in decline. And that's, that's a serious problem. There's some 25 different ways in which scientists have categorized some of the benefits that society receives from nature. And we'll talk about that again in a moment. But what's unresolved in this diagram is what happens next. If we continue business as usual and keep doing what we have been doing in terms of our impacts on nature, then we're like to re likely to reinforce these patterns that you see in each one of these graphs. And you can see it's all accelerating in recent years. So we might just expect to see this continue to accelerate until something bad happens and we don't know what that might be. Or alternatively, we might look for ways in which we can, we can modify human impacts on the planet, find ways to reduce our pressure on the planet, or even to reverse some of these changes that are giving society problems. And that's what I'd like to talk about tonight, how we can make things better for the planet and for society. And one of the things that gives me optimism is that most people on the planet are concerned about where the, where the world is headed and want to do something about it. So if we look at the, the 20 most industrialized nations, the G20 nations that uh, get together to talk about the economy and other stuff like that, we find that most of the citizens in these nations, more than half, are concerned about the state of the planet and three quarters of them believe that people are responsible for the de degeneration of our planet. And they also want government to prioritize the well-being of people and nature over jobs and the economy. Now, this isn't what we hear on television. It's not what we hear on the radio. That's because some voices are louder than others. But one thing that I think is important about these, these figures is that they suggest that we're potentially close to a social tipping point, a place where, where the, the attitudes of people about wanting a more sustainable planet can shift us in a direction that would take us there. Now, there, there are tipping points are something that are common in complex systems that are that are just so complex that you can't understand all of their various 
dynamics and dimensions. And one of the things that's characteristic about these complex systems is that they can continue for very long periods of time in some relatively stable configuration of conditions. And then suddenly things will change and very quickly you can shift to a new equilibrium, a new set of dynamics that puts you in a different space, in a different tra trajectory for the future. So I'm optimistic that we have the potential to see that happening with respect to the changes in the way humanity interacts with the planet. And that's what I want to figure out how we can play a role in changing this dynamic. Another thing I think gives me optimism is that there's lots and lots of success stories and opportunities to make things better. One, one aspect of a bad situation is that there's lots of ways to make it better. We're not, we're not looking out for, for we don't have a lack of things where we can improve. So let me give you one example. There was a, in 2004, I think it was, um, there was a, a college professor in Kinsale, Ireland, who uh, worked, on, worked out a class project to make their community, to imagine ways that their community could become less dependent on fossil fuels because they were concerned not about climate change, but they were worried that fossil fuels were gonna become so, so expensive that most people in that community wouldn't be able to afford to do the, to carry on the life as, that they had. And so they, they, they suggest, the students in this class took, they, well, they developed a plan for the community and they took this plan to the city council. And the city council said, well, that sounds pretty good, let's try it out. And so the city council decided to implement the plan that the students had, uh, had put together. And that's 10 years ago. Now there are 1,200 transition teams that are doing their version of this same kind of thing to make their community more sustainable. There's 1,700 green cities, which account for 25% of the urban population that have committed to being green cities, to, to moving their economy towards a greener con economy. Now, who's to know how much of that is talk and how much of, it's real, much of it is real action? But these things suggest that things can happen quickly and at very large scales if we can make it happen in our local community and have good ideas that can be transported to other places and communicate them there. Now, I'm optimistic this particular year because we finally have a president who wants to fix climate change. We have a Fairbanks Assembly that wants a climate action plan and have passed a resolution to make that happen. And we've got a community of scientists at the University of Alaska and in various agency who understand and support local climate action. So these are some of the tough things that are, that are difficult to put in place in order to act in ways that, that have real impact. So I'm optimistic that things that we might choose to do could make a difference. So how do we move towards sustainability? First of all, we need a vision. What is it that we want? And next, we need strategy or many strategies. How are we going to get there? And finally, how do we get started? What are the triggers that might make a large, have a large impact in engaging other people or helping us move towards the vision that we might choose? And there's lots of potential visions, and I don't want to tell you or suggest that there's a single right vision, but I'd like to suggest a process that we might consider. And this is just many, many people have different ideas about various processes. So this is just the way I think about it. It's not necessarily the best way. And it has to do with stewardship, which in my mind has to do with shaping the future for the benefit of both nature and for the health of nature and the health of society and for the benefits of both. 
So the vision behind this stewardship framework that, that I think about is that we want to enhance ecosystem health and human well-being for the benefit of both. And that's because people depend on nature and nature is increasingly at the mercy of what people do to it. And we need to have a strategy for getting there. And so my strategy is to shape pathways for of human nature interaction that are more sustainable than the pathways we've pursued in the past. It's not to say that we have to find the best pathway, but just something that's better than what we've done before. And I think most of us can imagine things that could be better than the way things have played out um, over the last century, as I showed you in that one slide. And then we need some triggers to get us started. So the key features of this stewardship framework are active intervention to shape change. The trends left the station. We can't go back to where we were. So we can reduce the impacts of things that are pushing in the wrong direction. But in general, we need to be proactive about shaping change for a favorable future rather than responding to crisis and feeling dedicated and committed to the, the patterns that or the conditions that we had in the past. So this means we need to think very carefully about what conditions we would like to see change, how we would like to see things different in the future. Another key feature is that it's a system of people as part of nature. Now, a lot of conservation uh, science in the past has been an effort to protect nature from people. And that's still important. There's still lots of ways in which people are doing things that are harmful to nature, harmful to society. And we ought to minimize the extent to which those damages uh, are propagated into the future. But at the same time, I think it's really important for us as a society to learn to love nature, to learn to be part of it, to learn to celebrate what it is and why we should enjoy having it. Why should any teenager care about what happens to nature when they could have so much fun playing on their phone. And finally, I see this as having two goals, each of which is important. So ecosystem health and human well-being. I don't want think we want to get in a situation of trying to ask whether People, society is more important than nature or vice versa. We want to find a way in which we can live with nature, live with the rest of nature. People are part of nature. So how can we be a constructive part of nature? <coughs> now, there's a lot of things I could say about the science of stewardship, but I probably won't say very much about it tonight because I want to get on to the practical stuff. Uh, ecologists and environmental scientists know a lot about how to sustain the properties of ecosystems on which we depend. We need to conserve soils, prevent climate from changing too rapidly, conserve the kinds of organisms that are present in ecosystems. Some of those may have gone or may go extinct, but there's other organisms that can at least partially fill their roles. And we need to maintain this disturbance regime with in terms of something that's compatible with the, 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 the species and the environmental properties that characterize an ecosystem. We need to sustain benefits to society, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And we need to sustain human well-being. And this means not only what, how well we're doing right now today, but how can we sustain society's long-term potential to thrive. So the benefits the society receives from ecosystem. On the right, you see a, uh, a box marked human well-being. These are the, the things that allow society to thrive. And these are affected by social processes, but they're also affected by lots of things that happen in ecosystems. So I wanna just briefly say what some of those categories of, of ecosystem benefits are. Some of the things we harvest from nature, 
the provisioning services like food, water, and timber. Some of them are services that protect us from, from environmental risks such as flooding, wildfires, drought. And so wetlands, for example, store water. And so if you get a sudden ma massive floods, if you've got in, intact wetlands, they can store a lot of this water and then it gradually leaks out downriver. And that prevents uh, very, very severe flooding. If, if you have a natural landscape in which there's uh, a, a, a patchwork of different types of ecosystems, some of those ecosystems are flammable and are quite likely to burn, but others are less flammable and can protect and can prevent those, those, those wildfires from spreading uh, extensively. And then there's cultural services. There's the reasons we live here in Alaska. I, I love living in Alaska. I don't want to go anywhere else. And nature's a big part of why I live here. And another big part of that is the friends and colleagues and other citizens that I interact with that also respect nature and do good things for it. And these sorts of cultural services and the recreational benefits we get from nature are intangible things that are very important to my satisfaction and my happiness in living here in Fairbanks. And I suspect the same is for <coughs> true for many of you. So then given these various social uh, factors and uh, the, the, the natural processes that influence society, we make decisions. And some of these decisions are, ex are to exploit nature for some of the, the products that we want, <coughs> food, water, so, so forth. And some of it is to act as responsible stewards who can uh, protect, who, who, can, who can minimize or reduce the intensity of human impact on nature and allow ecosystem processes to proceed in ways that allow nature to continue to deliver services to society. So that's all I'm going to say about science. Oops, no, it's not. That's all I'm going to say, I'm going to, all I'm going to say about natural science. But social scientists have been equally effective in figuring out how, to, how people can acquire the outcomes that give them satisfaction and give them a good life. And on the right, you see some factors that psychologists have identified as factors that everybody needs to have a satisfying life. Food and water, safety, security, and health, love and belonging, self-respect and respect from others, and the capacity to meet each individual's personal goals, rather than having that dictated by their, by their social circumstances. So these, this, these are the things that people everywhere in the world want, although the way different people define these will be different from one place to another. But what we really need to know is how we can, what are the processes by which, in which we need to intervene in order to deliver these outcomes? And just as a, as a crude overview, we can think about sustaining environmental and material conditions, sustaining the social relationships that provide good outcomes, such as love, belonging, and respect, and the empowerment of people to meet their own needs. And that, that's, a tough, that's a tough call, but I think in general terms, we have a good sense uh, as members of our community of how to do this. But the larger challenge is how do we make this equally or more possible for future generations? How, do, how can we provide the long-term foundations for well-being? And this gets beyond where we're, what we'll probably talk about today. But in general terms, we need to sustain uh, a viable e technology and economy, not necessarily the, the one that we have now, but a sustainable one. We need to sustain the environment and the opportunities for health. We need to sustain those social rules that allow everybody to have uh, a satisfying life. And we need to sustain the values that deliver these outcomes 
and these processes. A lot of this comes through everyday interaction with our families, our friends, and our neighbors. To, that's informal education. And in addition, formal education, if it's done properly, can provide and strengthen a lot of these processes that deliver good outcomes for society. So that's the social science piece of it. And let's go on. So I've tried to write down my perspective on some of these things in a book that I that was published last year, this book about grassroots stewardship. And it's not, I don't, I didn't try to say everything that talk about everything that needs to be done, but I tried to talk about what as I as a single citizen or you as an individual citizen could do to make these kinds of things happen. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things in there that I won't talk about tonight. And I think of four different levels of stewardship's actions that we might engage in as individuals. There's things we can do individually. There's a lot of things we can communicate our values and our, our ideas about stewardship uh, and communicate in a way that identifies common goals that we share with other people. There's ways that we can collaborate with other people, other groups, and there's political action that we can take for sustainability in order to shape larger scale social and political processes. And we'll talk about each of these briefly tonight. So let's start with individual actions, because that's something that I could go tomorrow and uh, take a better stab at, or you could. And there's two main parts of this that occurred to me. One is celebrating the connections that we have with nature and, and helping other people to learn about and celebrate these connections. And the second is reducing unnecessary consumption. So let's start with the first one. There's a couple of aspects to this. One that I mentioned earlier is a sense of identity, a sense of place. The, the things that we value about ourselves and our values that are connected to nature. So by going and spending time in nature, doing things that uh, benefit nature, whether it's stream restoration, a community garden, or uh, other things, uh, educational opportunities for our kids, it's a way for us and other people to recharge our batteries and keep optimistic, keep positive about uh, the track we'd like to see taken by society. And the other part of this is fostering other people's interactions with nature, because not everybody thinks of this the first thing when they wake up in the morning. Some people are, are focused on other things. And I think this is especially important in terms of our interaction with kids, because this is the way that we are best shot at instilling values and love of nature for the next generation. Gets kids out there in ways that they really enjoy it. Don't them, uh, and there's lots of ways to do this. And the folk school is one of the best groups I know of for getting kids out in nature, getting things, getting people in general, and especially kids doing things with natural products. The folk school is wonderful that way. But it's not, just protecting nature from people. It's getting out there and mixing it up with nature, going camping, going hiking, tinkering in our garden, uh, taking a walk in the park, uh, playing frisbee in, in, in the park with our kids or playing catch with, with kids, uh, taking kids to the zoo. There's uh, having a conversation under under trees in our neighborhood, taking a walk. So there's so many ways that we can interact with nature in a positive way. So now let's talk a bit about reducing unnecessary consumption. And this gets to the part where people begin to squirm and feel uncomfortably because it sounds like it's not gonna be much fun and it's gonna be unpleasant. So I think this business about encouraging 
uh, uh, about reducing unnecessary consumption has to be framed as a conversation about opportunities rather than all of the ugly, nasty things you're going to have to do in spite of what you'd really like to do. So let's let's give that a try. There's two general components of this. One is reducing population growth because there's too many people on the planet. And the other is reducing per capita consumption. Let me rephrase that first. And, that first one. There's never too many people. Every person on this planet is valuable and I wouldn't want to see them go away. But we're at a point where the number of people that are present on our planet is really stretching the capacity of the planet to meet our needs, much less our capacity to have a satisfying life. So if we can find ways to reduce population growth, then that will reduce the impacts of people on the reduce of reduce the impacts that society in general has on on the planet. And there's a couple ways of thinking uh, that I've thought a bit about this. One that many people in international development think about it is in terms of encouraging and providing opportunities for general education for girls. Now, this isn't saying anything about what that education should be, but just providing education, providing an opportunity for everybody to get an, at least the elements, the early elements of an education is important because then people can begin thinking about what they want to do with their lives and realizing that there may be more than just one option. And I don't, the ways in which this has been important in developing nations has not been related at all to issues of discussing, discussing population growth. It's just encouraging general education. So that's something that we can do that has no, I can't think of any uh, negative frameworks other than for people in power who benefit from the presence of an uneducated society. Now, another thing that I think most of us would, would view as a positive outcome would be to reduce unwanted pregnancies. Now, population, uh, Pop, birth control, population management, and even discussions of, of population are a very, very sensitive topic in American society. And I don't want to go there in its controversial sense. But what I'd like to suggest is that if we can find some, th some, some aspects of, of population that, that we might agree upon, such as uh, reducing the number of unwanted pregnancies. Then different social groups can go to their corners and think about how they might want to achieve that goal. So I've, this is just one example of a way of framing a positive conversation. There's so many ways in which this conversation has been framed in very vicious and um, controversial terms. But I think we can make a lot of progress if we just focus on those aspects on which we agree. And then as we have conversations where we begin to de develop trust, well, that's the next topic. So I'll get to that later. And then the second aspect is reducing per capita consumption, the amount of stuff that each of us uh, acqu acquires. And I seem to be unable to move my slides forward. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to come back and we'll see if we can get going again. Can you see this slide? Um, Carrie, nod yes or no? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And now we're back in business. Okay, so the reducing unwanted consumption. This is uh, a map of the ecological footprint of uh, the world uh, uh, by nation. And you can see that some nations are much, are extremely bloated compared to the maps that we're accustomed to seeing. And other nations like those in, 
in Southern Africa are all shriveled up. This is because those of us in developing nations are using more than our share of the world's resources, in part because we're taking uh, those resources from, from some of those uh, less developed nations. So we're using more than our share. So, but the flip side of this coin is that each of us on average has a 32 fold greater capacity to reduce our impact on the planet than does somebody, than does the average for the planet. So we, it's not, it is a global problem, but we're at, we're at the focal point of being able to make a difference and really turn the tide. So it really depends on those of us in, in developed nations to, to take the first step towards making this a sustainable planet. It's not to say that other nations, the less developed nations, don't have equally important opportunities and, and rights to make their own decisions about, how, about their, their, the future that they want to see. But I feel that we have a substantial obligation to do our share to reduce our historical and current impact on the planet. And this involves choosing what are some of the things that we need and want. I don't, we can't, con, we can't reduce our consumption of resources to zero. We, de, we depend on that for our day, for our lives, our individual lives. But there are a couple of things that we can do. We can pursue the, the non-consumptive or less consumptive dimensions of satisfaction and happiness. Rather than working overtime, we might choose to spend more time with our family and friends. We might choose to provide opportunities for our kids, which in turn give jobs to other people to help our kids uh, have these opportunities. So there's ways that are less consumptive of natural resources and provide more opportunities for our kids, ourselves, and our community. A second way thing that we can do as a general approach is to reduce our unnecessary consumption. Now, my unnecessary consumption might be different than yours, so I'm not going to tell you what unnecessary is, but I, one part of this that speaks to me is that the flip side of this is that we need to support honorable consumption. We need to recognize that all of us consume resources, that many of us can't access even the resources that we need to have for a good life. So we need to respect and honor, improve those opportunities for honorable consumption and focus primarily on the ways in which we can reduce unnecessary consumption, things that we might be able to be just as satisfied in our lives or more satisfied if we did without those. And this involves making decisions in our own lives and finding ways to nudge social norms and the behavior of others. Now, one of the things that's quite convenient is that people pay a lot of attention to what their neighbors do, or, and they especially pay attention to the behavior of those people that they respect and view as role models of the kinds of pe people that they would like to pe be, people whose lives they would like to emulate. So some positive norms that we might uh, carry on in our own life would be things like bicycling uh, from, to, to work on occasion, recycling and other things that are positive for the environment. We don't even need to say anything to other people just by illustrating that this is how we lead our lives. We've made a big step forward and we can do the same thing by reducing our demonstration of uh, the negative norms, the conspicuous consumption, the consumption of things that we don't really need. Now, uh, so again, I think we need to frame this as a positive conversation things that we can do to make our lives better, that things that we can do to help other people make lives better. So where do we start? These are some of the individual actions that uh, might be taken to, uh, to reduce our impacts on the planet. And on the right, you see a bunch of actions in gray that are typically highlighted as things that we should do to save the planet. 
And the x-axis here are the emission savings, the, the reductions in CO2 emissions that we could achieve by taking any one of these actions as an individual. And the ones on the left are the things that are less commonly mentioned when we begin to think about what are the things we could do to reduce our impact on the planet. And before I talk about any of these, I'd like to mention that these are not black and white alternatives. We're talking about having one less child, not having no children. So many people, including my wife and I, want to have children. We did, we, but we chose, we considered having a variety of different numbers of children and we de decided that we'd be quite happy with two. Uh, so having one less child is a choice that you can make and thinking, remembering back that each one of these children is going to have a 32 fold Im greater impact than someone from a developing nation gives you a sense of why it plays out this way. We could choose to have no car or we could choose to have our car less or to have fewer cars take one less transatlantic flight that's that's a big that's a big uh, block of cheese there in this diagram using renewable energy only now that's a challenge in today's world and we probably can't do that but maybe there's ways in which we can use a larger proportion of renewable energy eat a plant-based diet or if you're not into that at least try it for a while or Try it once a week and see how it goes with your family. Now, each of these, th the each of these actions is not an individual, is not an isolated individual action. As I mentioned when we were talking about social norms, it inter interacts with other people, and so we interact in our daily lives with other people that we respect and love, and so we need to find a set of actions that we choose to have that work for us in our social context. Now, I'm not asking you to beg off on doing any of these things. I'm just saying that we need to be aware of the trade-offs involved in these choices and choose those things where we feel that we can have a more satisfying life, a greater impact on, on a more sustainable future without sacrificing everything else in our lives. So, Effective communication is a really important part of this because no matter what I do, uh, it's going to be more effective if, if I can communicate this to other people. And I talked about that already in terms of social norms, but in terms of our more conventional uh, converse, uh, communication, it's helpful to start out thinking about points of agreement, our common ground, so that we can agree on the things that we might wish to do together. Rather than starting out, uh, uh, talking about the things about which we disagree. And I'll come back to this in a second. And discuss opportunities with others, working with people in our social network. Each one of us has a network of other people that we interact with that we that are going to be more responsive to things that I might say or you might say than anybody else you can influence people's opinions about things where I would never be able to influence them because you have their ear. They respect you. They interact with you. You've got some sense of, uh, of shared values. And so if each of us work with people in our social networks, that's a fantastic way to very efficiently make progress. And we also need to move beyond just preaching to the choir, not just talking to the people that we agree about. I'll come back to that again in a minute. So more about more of, about effective communication. The, the, I think the overarching uh, issue is how to build trust with our audience. We already have trust with many people. That's our social network. But building trust with your audience, talking about things, looking for our common ground, identifying points of agreement, rather than starting out by launching into what they've done and focusing on positive messages. S focus on the solutions that we can do together, take on together, rather than blaming them for the things they've done wrong or focusing on the things that they've done wrong. 
So this means that starting these conversations with somebody that you don't know well means start thinking about how you search for these uh, common grounds. And one person that's helped me a lot has been Sharon Baring, who does workshops on deep listening, how to listen deeply and respectfully, listening beyond the words that are said, listening beyond how that translates to your frame of lessons reference, but think about what they're saying uh, and what they really want to communicate. So I think learning how to listen deeply and respectfully is, it's not automatic. It's something that takes, takes some thought and some focus. So I think these are all ways in which we can have constructive conversations with friends, with people who share the same general values that we do. But we need to go beyond that and get involved in conversations with people who we uh, suspect might have different opinions than we do. Uh, and uh, think about ways to have conversations with them. And all of the things I've just said apply even more strongly to these difficult conversations than to our conversations with friend. Building trust, identifying points of agreement, looking for solutions rather than blaming people. All of these are extremely important as you launch into a difficult conversation. But some of the other uh, potential pitfalls that we might want to avoid are avoiding false dichotomies. The uh, jobs versus the environment. You've heard so many false dichotomies in, uh, in, political, uh, in political speeches that I don't need to tell you about them. Also realizing that differences of opinion aren't black and white. There's a whole spectrum of opinions. So if you think about the variety of opinions that people hold about climate change, for example, uh, some people that have studied this recognizes, recognize that there's a spectrum of opinions that range from being extremely concerned to absolutely dismissive. But there's everything in between. There's somewhat concerned. Uh, there's people who are confused about the arguments and don't really know where they stand on them. And then people that are suspicious, but they're, they're willing to listen. So the people that are dismissive of the importance of climate change are only 7% of the American population. So there's another 93% where we can make progress if we have constructive conversations. And if we're not the right person to have this conversation, talk to somebody else in those communities that are respected by people that you'd like to be able to reach. Maybe you're not the best messenger for all of these different people. So collaboration, it's a great way to magnify your indivi our individual efforts. Uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving is incredibly effective because it, it, narrow, it focuses in on a common value, protecting our children from being killed by drunk drivers. And this is the most, as I understand it, it's the most effective nonprofit organization in, in the country. And it's effective because it spans the political, uh, the political spectrum. It goes straight to things that we, values that we share. So I think collective action is going to be much more effective if we can quickly get to those ideals and those values that we share, protecting the earth for our grandchildren. Uh, there's a lot of collaborations among organizations that can lead to effective outcomes. And I don't have time to go into these now, but I'll just mention them. The, uh, the Yukon River Intertribal Shed, Intertribal Watershed Council has done an amazing job of bringing tribes and managers together. Uh, Fairbanks, Solarize Fairbanks brings together neighborhoods to install solar installations on individual houses. Public private partnerships are a way to engage, are ways to engage businesses. There's a new initiative on focusing on investing locally to strengthen our local economy. Now, I'm not going to go into this either, but this uh, is the, uh, a diagram that illustrates a really important finding in my mind 
from the social sciences, from management, that you don't need to agree in order to collaborate. So some of the toughest management issues, such as uh, uh, logging versus at logging and conservation, uh, the spotted owl controversy. These people came together to solve problems. And the reason they were able to do this, even though they totally disagreed on the causes of the problem and what needed to be done, was that they shared a problem, a viable community. And they couldn't, none of these groups could solve that problem on, they, on their own. They had to come together to solve it. And so they had to come into a, tr a collaborative pr process that involved building trust and committing to that process. And maybe the first step in this process is just to be willing to sit down in the same room without yelling at each other. But that's a start. And then you can go around the loop again until you get to a better place. Some of my favorite organizations are those that bridge with other organizations, collaboration among groups. Two of my favorite examples are the folk school. And uh, since you're here already, I suspect a lot of you know about some of the wonderful things the folk school does, not only on their own, but in collaboration with other groups and with business. Uh, another of my favorite groups is the Fairmax Climate Action Coalition. I want to mention this especially because it has six different working groups. All, all of these working groups subscribe to the same goal of finding ways in, fair, in which Fairbanks can reduce its impact on the climate and therefore on society and reduce its impact on vulnerable peoples. But each of these groups wor works on a different set of issues. They speak to a different audience and therefore, they use a different vocabulary and a different mode of communication to build trust and, and develop bridges with other organizations and with uh, the, the community. I really like what they do. So political action. I've uh, said more than I should have so far. But let me just go over this briefly. First of all, we. I think each of us has a responsibility to uh, fulfill our role as a citizen. And this involves informing ourselves rather than listening blindly to other people that spout our worldview. And I'm just as guilty of this as the next person. Voting and encouraging others to vote, participating in government, uh, either actively or through encouraging our representatives to act in a more sustainable way or act to promote sustainability and challenging inequities through protests or planning for transformation. And there's a nice set of uh, guidelines about how to transform, how to promote transformation to a different, uh, to a system that has a different set of dynamics that I don't have time to go into here. But the bottom line is if there's a crisis, don't waste it, use this as a opportunity to move along a new pathway toward a more sustainable future. So I won't summarize what I've already talked about. So what do we do now? Well, we need to be informed. We need to know what works, what nature needs, what people need. We need to imagine a bed, better world that never has been, but how could things be different? And how can we take responsibility of some small steps that might lead to that better world? And the answer to this, these questions are going to be different for each of us. I can't do everything, uh, so I'm gonna be more effective if I prioritize and just do some things which means that I'm not going to be as effective in doing other things that I might care deeply about, but I need to, I need to choose my battles. So how do I go about making a decision like this? Well, it, for me personally, some of the ingredients that go into this decisions are, what are the things that are most important to me? What am I most passionate about? Secondly, how can I be most effective? How do my particular knowledge and skills and my social network enable me to do things that somebody else might not 
be able to do as effectively. And as I said before, each of you is going to be able to do some wonderful things that I could never do as effectively as you can do them. And next, what will have the greatest impact? I talked about that with respect to consumption. The same thing applies to communication, to uh, collaboration and everything else. And finally, what would I most enjoy doing if I'm not having fun doing these things? then I'm not going to put my full energy into it. It's got to be fun. Not all of it has to be fun. Some of it's hard work and is difficult and challenging and sometimes unpleasant. But how can I get the greatest satisfaction out of making the world a better place? And I think that's those are the questions each of us needs to answer for ourselves. And I've used up my time. So I would appreciate your comments and questions. And I. Uh, unmute yourselves and ask outright or Carrie may have some questions that she's uh, honed in on from the chat. Um, the only one that was in the chat earlier was just it just says glass recycling in the borough with a question mark. I think just maybe as a that that would be a great move um, for us to make. Not sure. Yep, that's a place where, where the borough can certainly improve and yeah. each of us individually can improve that. It's recycling isn't just taking things to the transfer station, it's tool libraries, it's uh, training skills. Uh, a lawyer and, uh, and a mechanic can get together and say, ah, we each have a problem we need to solve. Maybe we can trade our skills and do something different. So we need to think about these things innovatively in terms of recycling. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, someone else asked, how can I get involved in the Fairbanks Climate Action Plan? That's a good question. The Borough Assembly has uh, passed a resolution to form a climate action plan that uh, that uh, there was a request for proposals and uh, some different groups have put in submitted proposals that are in the process of being evaluated. And then the next step beyond this is that whatever contractor is chosen to develop this climate action plan will be going out to the community to ask for your involvement and that's that's a place where there's no limit to the kinds of inputs you can provide in terms of your opinion, provision of information, ideas about how to make it all happen. There's lots of ways that you can get involved. But uh, and those and I think it should be moving to this community stage early in the new year. Uh, the decision about a, a, a contractor will be made uh, probably by the end of this year. I have another, I guess, follow up. Um, I think that one really great solution is uh, the Interior Alaska Land Trust. So um, I don't know, I'd like to hear more about like if there's any group working on plans to protect land uh, around Fairbanks um, that could maybe collaborate with Land Trust. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic point. I love what the Land Trust does. It not only protects land that's uh, in, that would, significantly change the quality of our interactions with nature in the vicinity of Fairbanks, but it has ways of doing this that might reduce risks of wildfire as well as risks of development. And so there's collaborations with uh, with fire managers, with uh, the, the Alaska Fire Science Consortium, which is uh, which is works with managers and citizens and scientists to develop uh, effective wildfire plans. Uh, so I think there's lots of ways of protecting land. I think another way in which this could happen is encouraging individual landowners to, to use their lands in ways 
that uh, benefit nature and society. It doesn't all have to be pu owned publicly or owned by uh, NGOs. So I think there's a lot of arrangements, a lot of uh, institutions, a lot of uh, arrangements by which land can be protected in ways that benefit nature and people. But I, that's a great question. Thanks, Kristen. Um, Terry, someone in the chat wrote something to keep in mind with the FNSB Climate Action Plan is that since we are a second class borough, our powers are limited. And as a result, the focus of the plan will be on borough operations. That's a very good point. And it's true that the borough has certain responsibilities. It has certain uh, things it's authorized to do and some things that it's not authorized to do. So I think in terms of planning for uh, climate action in Fairbanks, it probably needs to go beyond the borough. As you just explained for very clear reasons, the borough can't do everything. So there's lots that's left for the rest of us to do, uh, both through other, other organizations, other initiatives, and through collaboration of those initiatives with things that the, the borough might do. And there's lots of educational uh, initiatives that could be promoted that would that would be very effective ways to advance uh, to re to reduce Fairbanks impact on the climate and that uh, the borough plans would never would would have difficulty accomplishing. So I think there's lots of avenues for progress and we need to begin in many different places. The borough is one place. There's other NGOs that are doing amazing stuff. And then as all of these entities move forward things about thinking about ways that which we can coordinate these activities so that they can all be as effective as possible someone else also posted a link to the fnsb sustainability commission are you familiar with that that's a wonderful com commission it does wonderful things in terms of promoting sustainable actions by the borough. I've got nothing but respect for what that group does. But there, uh, as I understand it, uh, several people have dropped off that commission and they, they, would, benefit, they would benefit from a re-energized public interest in their activities, either through participation of new individuals who might volunteer to join that commission or for support or uh, input of ways that that commission could operate more effectively. I'm, one of the things I glossed over is that each of us has a responsibility to be active in our political system, and that's a great way to do it. Yeah, it's funny that you said that because Ariana also posted, we are accepting applications for commissioners on that committee. Yay! <laughs> I would like to say we we have three openings on the Sustainability Commission. It's a oh, wow. all volunteer um, citizen participation commission, and uh, I would encourage anyone who's interested to who wants to learn more about it. Um, we meet the second Wednesday of the month, generally at 6 p.m. Um, the next meeting will actually be on a Friday in November, that second Friday of the month, but you can find information on the, the link posted in the chat. So I do encourage folks to attend if you wanna get involved in what um, what is within the power of the borough and what recommendations can be made to the mayor. Thanks, Ariana. That's a, that, I'm so glad that you laid that out explicitly. So that's a place where if you want to have a big impact on what goes on in the borough, that's a wonderful opportunity.
Anyone else have comments, questions? No. Well, um, Terry, I just have to say, I mean, I think one thing that I just struggle with is that kind of um, um, trying to, to make that bridge to the, you know, the people, the folks that are outside of my social circle that I know don't necessarily have the same um, political views as me. And it's something I think about a lot. I've been thinking about a lot recently and kind of how to do that. So I really appreciate some of the tips that you've mentioned in so, just trying to find common ground and yeah. that, that there have to be issues that, that most of us are in fact concerned about and finding those and then trying to move things forward, you know, through that avenue. I think that's a great way to look at it. Well, some uh, we we each of us occasionally gets thrown together with people who uh, have different uh, worldviews, different perspectives on things than we do. And if we just use those opportunities as a way to have a conversation, when I leave my car off to get fixed and and get a ride to campus or something like that, uh, I often ask uh, the guy that's driving the car if if I. Uh, we get to talking about the weather and I ask if it's different than what he remembered growing up. And he tells me all about climate change. And I don't know what his political opinions are. I, we, we never talked about that, but it, it gave us an inroad into talking about climate change in a way that's meaningful to him and to me. Another thing that I really uh, am excited about is uh, efforts by the uh, interfaith working group of the Fairbanks Climate Action Coalition, which is working with various communities of faith and uh, uh, deliberately trying to work with communities whose congregations span the political uh, spectrum, span the, the spectrum of, of uh, economic challenges, and uh, trying to find ways to, to initiate constructive conversations with those people because and we've found that each of these people really cares about and is taking strong actions to care for the earth to care for vulnerable people so we don't need to go to our world views that might be represented in a particular congregation or in our own group to have meaningful conversations about how we can make this world a better place. We just need to support them in things they're already doing. We don't need to convince them. And once the trust begins to build, the, the conversations can deepen and we can begin to joke about some of the things that we might appear to disagree about. Yeah, and uh, Lisa said um, one thing to consider too that um, is that we're all part of um, GVA, so we all have a voice in our energy co-op. Um, so Absolutely. commenting on their doings and voting for board members can make a difference. Yes, we we are so lucky in Fairbanks to have a cooperative rather than a for-profit electrical company. So let's let's make the most of it. Well, thanks very much to all of you for sitting in and listening to what I had to say. This has been great. I pre really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, Terry. We we really appreciate you um, giving your time to this.